performing at a local mall where she plays a toy saxophone and gets a warm round of applause from the shoppers. Tragically, John Bonet would be murdered at Christmas, her happiest time of the year. This is Kelly from Kelly's Unexplained, and we're here to talk about the John Bonet Ramsey case. Honest with you, this one was really, really hard for me to do. Um, I guess because for two reasons. One, I was 16 when this happened, and uh, I remember reading about this in the papers. It was on the news everywhere. I kind of related to that little girl. And then now as a mother, I have a blonde haired little girl. And I just, as a mom, it, it just strikes a chord with me because I feel like this could be my daughter. Let's go ahead and dive into the story. I do want to issue a warning. The following presentation contains information regarding graphic violence against a child. Viewer discretion is advised. The six-year-old Colorado beauty queen who got it from her mother, a former beauty queen herself. We felt like we knew her because there were so many videos and photos of her due to the pageant world. We were welcomed into her life. Hi. Do you want to hold the microphone for me? Yeah. Okay, let's see Jean-Pierre. Oh, my God. What are you doing? I want to be, um... A doctor or a nurse to help people get well. A pediatrician. Thank you so much, Jean Bonnet. Let's give her a big hand. Christmas 1996. This was the last picture of John Bonet and her mother right before Christmas, her favorite time of the year. Two nights before Christmas, the Ramseys hosted a Christmas party, as they do every year. They invited their friends, their family, uh, the neighbors, you know, their closest loved ones. This may have been the beginning to the catalyst of her murder. Let's examine what happened two nights before she died. At 6.47 p.m., someone in the household placed a 911 call from inside the house at the adult Christmas party. But once the dispatcher answered, the mysterious person hung up the phone without saying anything. The police immediately called back, but only got the answering machine. At 6.54, an officer arrived at the house to do a welfare check. They were dismissed by the Ramseys, and after the cops realized there was no emergency, they left the property without incident at 7.09. The reason for this mysterious call has never been identified. Two days later, Christmas Day arrives, and as you know, the kids are opening up their presents as normal, and they're all excited. So, let's see what happens on Christmas Day. This is the very last time John Bonet Ramsey would open up any Christmas presents, December 25th, 1996. It was her favorite time of the year. But this is Jean Bonet. She's four. Burke is seven. And we'd like to welcome you to our home and wish you a very Merry Christmas. Morning of December 26th, 1996 in Boulder, Colorado. Patsy Ramsey claimed to have discovered a ransom note for her six-year-old daughter, John Bonet Ramsey. It was discovered on the back staircase inside the house. This prompted Patsy to call the police at 5.52 a.m. to report John Bonet as missing. Here is the call. 911 emergency. Oh, we need him. Police. What's going on? 5, 5, 15, What's going on there, ma'am? We have a kidnapping. All right, please. Explain to me what's going on, okay? Yeah, we have a... There's a note left, and our daughter's gone. A note was left, and your daughter is yeah. gone? How old is your daughter? Six years old. She's blonde. Six years old. How long ago was it? I don't know. I just found the note. And my daughter's gone. Did you say who took her? What? Did it say who took her? No. I don't know. It's, there's, a, there's a ransom note here. It's a ransom note? It says FBTC. Victory. Okay, what's your name? Are you Kathy Ramsey? I'm the mother. Oh my God! Please. I'm, okay, I'm sending an officer over. Okay. Please. Do you know how long she's been gone? No, I don't. Please, we just got out and she's right here. Okay. Please. Okay. 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 Okay.
my God, please. Okay, come well, this room, honey. I am, honey. Please. Take a deep breath. Please. Please. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Kathy, 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 Kathy. People inside the home at the time were her father, John Ramsey, her mother, Patsy Ramsey, and her brother, Burke Ramsey, who was nine years old. What is strange is that her body was actually found eight hours later inside the home in the basement. She was there the whole time. The body was found by John Bonet's father, John Ramsey. She was found with duct tape on her mouth and a cord around her neck. The crime scene was heavily compromised by everyone around the scene, cops, family members. Police claimed that they didn't search the house after her call because they believed that she was kidnapped, not murdered in the home. At the time of her death, John Bonet Ramsey was a well-decorated beauty pageant queen, having won at least five high-profile competitions. Her death was ruled a homicide. John Bonet was bludgeoned to death, according to the autopsy. However, the county coroner said that she died of asphyxiation. A paintbrush that was used as Patsy's hobby was used to tie the rope that strangled John Bonet. There was DNA found on John Bonet's long johns and underwear, both belonging to a secret unidentified man who was then compared to the FBI database of convicted violent offenders, which came up with no match among 1.5 million samples. There were two sets of unidentified footprints found at the scene inside the house, not outside. There was a rope found in John Bonet's bedroom that did not belong to the Ramsey family. But as of 2006, the police did not test the rope. If someone broke into the house, they did so cleanly as there were no footprints on the snow outside, as well as no sign of forced entry anywhere. Let's move on to the contents of the ransom note. It specifically requested $118,000 in exchange for John Bonet. The exchange was gonna take place the next day on December 27th between 8 and 10 a.m. The ransom note says, Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We respect your business, but not the country that it serves. Two gentlemen watching over your daughter do not particularly like you, so I advise you not to provoke them. Speaking to anyone about your situation, such as police or FBI, will result in your daughter being beheaded. You can try to deceive us, but be warned that we are familiar with law enforcement countermeasures and tactics. You stand a 99% chance of killing your daughter if you try to outsmart us. Follow our instructions and you stand a 100% chance of getting her back. Letter was signed SBTC Victory. These initials still remain unknown to this day. This is strange amount because it came to a very specific number and come to find out it was the exact amount of the Christmas bonus he received from his work. However, the most chilling fact about the ransom note was that it was written with the Ramsey pen and paper inside their home and there was a practice round done before the actual ransom note was finished. This fact is horrifying and it brought a lot of suspicion into the integrity of the note. This suggests that the killer entered the house wrote a practice note, then the ransom note, and for some reason, killed John Bonet anyway, right after writing it, instead of getting the money. December 27th, a detective came because they were expecting a call between 8 and 10 a.m. that had to do with the ransom. They were going to meet up and he was gonna give them the details. So this officer gives a, a detailed explanation about what happened and what she saw the day of December 27th. John was actually making arrangements to pay the money until a forensics team came to survey the house. John Bonet's bedroom was the only room closed off to prevent contamination. However, absolutely no precautions were taken to prevent the same being done to the rest of the house. Police later admitted they made no such effort because they believed this was a kidnapping and there was no reason to believe John Bonet was still in the house. Many of the Ramsey's family and friends arrived to support them, and they picked up things and cleaned surfaces, destroying possible evidence. Boulder Detective Linda Arndt arrived at 8 a.m. the next morning, preparing for the kidnapper's phone call and waiting on the killer's instructions. How did he strike you? 
Cordial. Cordial? Mm-hmm. Upset? Cordial. Distraught? Cordial. Did it strike you at all that he was, that that was behavior that was unusual for somebody whose child was just kidnapped? It's been my experience that people respond to trauma in different ways. So if someone has a response that is different from mine, I don't put judgment to it, I'll just, I'll just note it. But what's strange is that the kidnapper gave the deadline of 10 a.m. as the phone call for the ransom. That deadline came and went, and no one in the house panicked or said a thing. There's no acknowledgement within the house from anyone that the deadline imposed by the author of the ransom note has come and gone. Nobody said it's 10 o'clock and the kidnappers haven't called? Nobody said that. Was that something else you took note of? Absolutely. It wasn't until 1 p.m. that the detective aunt asked John Ramsey or his friend Fleet to search the house again to find some more evidence. But she also made it perfectly clear that if they do find anything, that they shouldn't touch it in order to maintain evidence. Weirdly, John immediately went down to the basement straight away, like he knew she was there. Why start there? It's the most logical entry point. And that's when he came across, sadly, the deceased body of his six-year-old daughter, John Bonet. Her mouth was covered with duct tape, and her wrist and neck were bound with rope, and her torso was covered by a blanket. The window was left open, and there was a suitcase underneath it, as if someone had used it for a stepladder or to climb on. Despite the officer's instructions, John still picked up his daughter and carried her upstairs, now contaminating the crime scene and possibly destroying evidence. John Ramsey carrying John Bonet up the last three steps from the basement. And, um, and my mind exploded. And everything that I had noted that morning that stuck out instantly made sense. I ordered him to put John Bonet down. I knelt next to her and I leaned down to her face. And John leaned down opposite me and um, his face was just inches from mine. And we had a nonverbal exchange that I will never forget. And he asked if she was dead. And I said, yes, she's dead. And I told him to go back to the room and to dial 911. And as we looked at each other, I remember and I wore a shoulder holster, tucking my gun right next to me and consciously counting I've got 18 bullets. Why did you do that? Because I didn't know if we'd all be alive when people showed up. I would said that everything made sense in that instance. I knew what happened. Do you think your fear was well-founded? You bet I do. There's no doubt in my mind. To this day? Never wavered. You were afraid because you thought the killer was still in the house. I knew it. When I found her, it was a rush of relief. And then, of course, within moments, I realized that she probably was dead. But she was back in my arms. Let's take a look at the notepad and the ransom note used because it contains a lot of evidence in this case. Analysis of the notepad used suggested that a practice letter was written on the same notepad and part of the practice note was found. There were spelling errors on the note that were thought to be easy like possession, but then there were complicated words like attache with an accent mark on the E. They were spelled correctly. Some believe that this adds up to the letter being a hoax. And combined with the lack of evidence of an intruder, this case becomes even more puzzling. So Nancy Grace, uh, who's, I, I guess, a prosecuting attorney, crime scene expert, has weighed in on this case quite a bit. And she talks to Dr. Oz about her theories in this case. So let's look at Nancy Grace and the handwriting expert that analyzed Patsy Ramsey's handwriting. I thought you were hired 
and you believe she did author the note? Probably did, yes. Could you help us understand what handwriting experts look at to determine that and how you were able to identify or at least come to that conclusion? Well, there's, there's eight basic elements that we look for. Shape, size, slant, uh, baseline, continuity, arrangement. Then there's two, uh, two categories that just simply weren't available. It's speed and pressure. You have to have originals. In my report, I could not go to uh, most probably or definitely because I was lacking those two elements. So I said she probably wrote the note. And what was it about the way she wrote it, and if you could just compare it to another you know, thank you note she written to someone that would tip you off? Is it, is it literally the way that the letters are shaped? Is it? It's uh, a combination of things. What happened in this note, it was clearly a disguised handwriting. You can see that the, you can see that the uh, elements of the handwriting uh, begin with uh, less definition of shape, size, slant, etc. until the left hand begins to accommodate the learning of the formation of the letters. And then the handwriting begins to more and more and more represent Patsy Ramsey's handwriting. And she was ambidextrous. Just one, so she's ambidextrous, mm -hmm. I understand. Mm -hmm. This note's written with her left hand. You can tell that because look, if you look at the G's, the letter comes over to the left. The That's more obvious in the W's, actually. W's. If, uh, is there anybody here who's left-handed? Okay. For instance, if you do a check mark with the right hand, you might check mark like that. Yeah. If you do it with your left hand, you do it like that. There's a mirror image that occurs. Yes. So in the W, which was crucial in this, you see a squeezing of the first cup of the W, uh, which is a mirror image of a wider cup in the W that you see in the natural hand. But by the time we get to the end of the note, she's fixed it. We're beginning to see that. Yeah, we're beginning to see an opening. And all of us came to the same conclusion. Independently. Pastor. Independently. So I'm Good. a believer. Yeah. yeah. So am I. Judith, <laughs> you, 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 you actually knew her. You knew her writing. And you're not an expert in handwriting. Yeah. But as a friend, did you think that she'd written that letter? When I looked at the ransom note, to my surprise, I saw, and I wasn't a hand, handwriting expert by all means, but I saw, um, I saw similarities. And in a Christmas card, she would write about the family, a kind of a brag letter, and it used the term "and hence." And in the note, it said, and hence. So you obviously are thinking that it's her because she's using these weird words. Let me ask you the hard question, since you were closer to this case than just about anyone. Mm -hmm. What happened to John Benet Ramsey that night? In well, your opinion. She I was murdered. And I don't believe the intruder theory. One notation that um, was not mentioned was it had snowed that night. And there were no footprints in the snow. So you don't believe it's an intruder? No. Ha, ha, who killed her? Why did she die? Inside, somebody, the family knew. In the early part of the case, the Ramsey family was under intense scrutiny given the suspicion of the ransom note's authenticity and the little evidence that supports the intruder theory. The actual person responsible for her murder varies depending on who you ask. According to television reports, some believe that Patsy accidentally killed her daughter and tried to cover it up. Others suspect her brother Burke killed John Bonet on accident and Patsy covered it up to protect him from getting in trouble. However, for, for Patsy or Burke to be the culprit, not only would the note have to have been staged, but so would the strangulation. And that wouldn't add up as the autopsy shows that John Bonet was still alive as she was being strangled. The FBI brought in five handwriting analysis experts to review the note. John Ramsey was ruled out immediately. However, Patsy was not. It was found that it was possible that she could have wrote it. There were similarities between her samples and the note, and she was also ambidextrous. So there's two major theories. There's the intruder theory, and there's the family theory. The intruder theory has three different suspects. 
Experts believe that this case was more consistent with child abduction and murder done by an intruder. Also in 2013, it came to light that in 1999, a grand jury indicted the Ramseys on charges of child abuse resulting in her death. However, the Boulder District Attorney at the time, Alex Hunter, did not sign the indictment, saying there was not enough evidence to support the charges. Casting further doubt on the theory is the fact that the DNA evidence found at the crime scene officially exonerated the Ramseys of all wrongdoing. the fourth suspect in this case. A local man named Bill Reynolds who visited the house two days before the murder as Santa Claus at the house Christmas party. His own daughter had been kidnapped in 1974, 22 years before John Bonet was murdered. What's crazy is his wife had written a play before the murder of John Bonet about a child getting molested and then murdered in the basement. According to the Denver Post, this man felt very close to John Bonet. Here's a quote from him. Her murder was harder on me than my own operation. She made a profound change in me. He even brought a vial of glitter gifted to him by John Bonet into heart surgery. The gift had been meaningful to him and that no child had given him anything before while playing Santa. He asked his wife to mix his ashes with the glitter if he died. I know I didn't do it, so I'm not nervous. I'm not worried about it. However, beyond those details, there was no evidence to indict him, and some suggested it was just weird acts of a kind old man. Next suspect is Gary Oliva. This man lived a few blocks away at the time of the murder. In 2016, Oliva was arrested on child pornography charges. In December 2000, he was arrested again on unrelated drug charges and was found to be carrying a picture of John Bonet in his backpack. He told the deputy at the time the reason he had the photo was because her murder touched him very deeply. I felt she was an exceptional girl whose death was an exceptional loss. I felt the need to build a monument, a shrine to remember this little girl. A high school friend of Oliva named Michael Vale revealed in an interview with In Touch magazine that Oliva called him a day after the murder and said, I hurt a little girl. I hurt a little girl. According to Vail, Oliva revealed the location of where he had hurt this little girl, and it was in Boulder, Colorado. After this, Oliva hung up the phone. This is interesting because records show that John Bonet was the only little girl that was murdered in the area that night. Vail also said that the method used in the strangulation was also used in another strangulation when he wrapped a cord around his mother's neck when he attempted to strangle his own mother. Nonetheless, once again, Gary Oliva was not a DNA match. The final suspect is John Mark Carr, a divorced father and elementary school teacher. Carr did not become a suspect until 2006, nearly 10 years after the murder, when he confessed to the murder via email to a journalism professor named Michael Tracy. Tracy had emailed Carr back and forth for four years to gain his trust. Tracy said this of his experience, you are hearing a truly dark side of the human psyche and having to pretend it was okay that I wasn't going to sit in judgment because otherwise the communication would have stopped. This is the worst experience of my life by far. It was horrible. In his emails, Carr used similar wording as the ransom note. At one point, he used Patsy's mother's nickname, Nettie, in an email. And it was bizarre that he would even know that. Carr would eventually write that he was in love with John Bonet and later confess to hitting her over the head with a flashlight. Here's some of the writings of one of the emails. He, of course, was asleep from the time that she was, that I took her from her bed and took her down to the basement. Her first reaction was, where am I? And I said, you're in the basement. She wasn't in that little room to be disgraced, and I would never disgrace her or dishonor her. She was there temporarily, and what hurts me is that she stayed there, and that's where her father found her, and it's just a horrible thing. I love on August 16, 2008, with the help of British intelligence, the Royal Thai authorities, and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, they were able to track down Carr in Bangkok, Thailand, where he had traveled from the U.S. to escape child pornography charges in California. Carr's DNA once again did not match the DNA at the scene, and he was not charged with the murder. 
However, Homeland Security continued to investigate him because he had always maintained that he had not acted alone. And if you recall, there were two sets of footprints inside the home. It's worth mentioning that Mark Beckner, the lead investigator of the murder case, said his confession once they shared it with us did not match the evidence at the scene. We knew in about 18 hours he was not the guy. We were also able to confirm he was not even in Colorado at the time of the murder by doing routine checking and obtained photos of him in Georgia at the time. Now that we have looked at the suspects, it is important to note that in a recent CBS special, Dr. Henry Lee, a DNA expert best known from the O.J. Simpson case, studied the DNA from the John Benet Ramsey crime scene. He found that her underwear may have held transfer DNA from the manufacturing process. He actually proved this by testing an unopened package of underwear that matched the ones she wore that night, which also had more DNA on them. CBS said that the DNA found at the murder site was fallacious, meaning any one of the former suspects could now be reconsidered. Car, am yes. I seeing his face again? This is theory number one, the intruder theory. Okay, the intruder theory. That's actually very, very rare, okay? Let's just start with that umbrella. Number one, John Mark Carr. Let me just say, perv. There's really no good way to put it. He was obsessed with John Bonet. He was caught on secretly recorded tape recordings where he's talking about he wants to get into the casket with her, oh. okay, for not a good reason. This guy confessed, okay, he gave statements suggesting he was the one that killed John Bonet Ramsey. However, it took very little time to get a photo of him in the city of Atlanta at the time she was killed in Colorado out. He didn't do it, and they knew it from the get-go. So, out. You want me to move to Santa? Yeah, this is, this McReynolds? Is, yeah, but actually, he was Santa Claus. He was Santa. Not yeah. just kidding. <laughs> Patsy and John Ramsey hired him to come over and play Santa. Now, can you imagine Santa crawling in that broken window that's about that big? There was no forced entry, mm -hmm. nothing. Santa McReynolds was later ruled out. Santa did not do it. What about this guy who looks oh. dangerous? He Gary. looks dangerous because he is dangerous. This guy is a pedophile. This guy was doing hard time, Gary Oliva. When he was stopped, he was quasi homeless. He had a backpack with a stun gun and a photo of John Benet Ramsey in his backpack. Mm. Now, Dr. Oz, we've all heard the stun gun theory, but the police chief at the time ixnayed that. Not a stun gun. He would probably read about it. So just to summarize everybody, you don't think much of this theory, in part because you know over your life experience, it's not usually what happens. And plus, they've been ruled out. Okay, let's go to theory number two. And the family theory has three different suspects. Horrible as it sounds, the Ramses themselves were involved. <laughs> so okay, walk us Dr. Oz, the let me just clear something up right off the top. A lot of theories abounded and people would just get on TV and say anything about this boy, Burke. Mm. I would put everything I own, which isn't much, but I put everything I own that Burke had nothing to do with his sister's death. Number one, fratricide sibling murder is so incredibly rare. But Dr. Oz, look at this picture for a moment. Just step back. Who is the center? She is. Did you get my Christmas card? I'm in the back <laughs> peeking from over the yes. twins' head. Okay. It's about them and Santa. She orchestrated this family photo. She's the center. She's the star. Patsy Ramsey, a beauty queen herself. Look, that was Patsy's world, and they were just living in it, okay? So if I can rule out Burke that night, sound asleep, statistically unlikely, this is the reason I don't think John Ramsey had anything to do with it. She, John Bonet, still had a fully intact hymen. If she had been molested by an adult male, they wouldn't have stopped with just digital penetration. That wouldn't happen. There would have been a full-blown molestation of this child. It never happened. Nope. Now, the reason suspicion hangs over them is because at the very beginning, these two lawyered up, and they didn't give a full statement for about five months. Several months went by before they would give a statement to police. That made people suspicious. And think about it, Dr. Oz. Common sense. 
you find a ransom note, a two and a half page ransom note, no sign of forced entry, and a ransom note, but then they say, oh, you know, forget all the $118,000. I'll just kill her and leave her here. It just doesn't make sense. In fact, the police chief, Dr. Oz, says, the then police chief, that the ransom note was written after the child was killed. Is that right? That's what he said. There's a heavy scrutiny uh, over the brother, Burke. And let's take a look at Dr. Phil and his interview with Burke and see what you think. I'll let you take a look at the interview and you can decide for yourself. People that believe that you killed your sister. <laughs> look at the evidence or the lack thereof. Fabricating this ransom note if she was strangled then causing the head injury. Doing all of this cover up was all done to protect you because they didn't want to lose two children. That's their theory. I, I don't know what to say that because I know that's not what happened. Did you do anything to harm your sister, John Bonet? No. Did you murder your sister, John Bonet? No. Like, you won't find any evidence because that's not what happened. I know I didn't do it. Work in the kitchen when that 911 no. call was made? No. Were you there when that call was made? No. So you were not there and you did not speak those words? That's correct. With a golf club? Not on purpose. <laughs> she was standing behind me and I went like that. that look like her handwriting? <laughs> Honestly, looking at that, she would always bug me about having good handwriting and she would like make me rewrite stuff to try to get me to have good handwriting and I think it's too sloppy. <laughs> Your sister over the head with a baseball bat or a flashlight? Absolutely not. There was no evidence of rape, but there was possible evidence of sexual molestation, and it couldn't be ruled out. The medical examiners who examined the body said they saw signs of previous sexual abuse, so whoever did this had been sexually molesting her for a while. Her family doctor, though, did say they didn't notice these signs before her death. Have any knowledge or suspicion that John Bonet had been sexually abused or molested in any way? No. Did you ever sexually abuse John Bonet? No. I always thought it was like a pedophile who saw her in one of the pageants and snuck in. John Bonet was a pedophile's dream come true. I believe he brought her down to the farthest, deepest part of that basement and did very brutal things to her. John Bonet was the ultimate sex abuse victim. She was killed for it. One theory is that the murder was accidental and that strangulation was used to deter investigators during the evidence process. However, the autopsy showed that she was strangled while she was still alive. The hit to the head didn't kill her. It was concluded that the hit to the head happened around 45 minutes to two hours before she was strangled to death. Also, there was inconclusive DNA found under her fingernails, which shows that there was a struggle making it even more unlikely it was someone she knew and trusted and impossible that it was an accident. The intruder theory was mostly held together by the two sets of footprints found in the basement. There was a footprint in the mold on the ground of the basement and the investigators thought that it was from a hiking boot. Yeah. Did, did you own any hiking boots that you might have worn in the basement at some time? Yeah, I did. I don't remember the brand, but I, I remember it had a little compass on the shoelace. And the investigators point to that footprint as evidence against you. Yeah. What's your response to that? It's my house. I went and played in the basement all the time with the train set. So if, if they determined to, that to be my footprint, that doesn't really prove anything. Burke Ramsey never owned a pair of high-tech boots. So that one example shows you that I'm absolutely right when I talk about this so-called theory about Burke. Nobody in the Ramsey family owned any high-tech boots. It is also believed that the stun gun marks could have been from Burke's toy train track and was used as a weapon that he owned at the time. 
A rope was also found in John Bonet's room, which didn't belong to the family, but it wasn't tested for DNA, and police often ignored evidence like this because they were constantly focused on members of the family. After all, there were no footprints found outside, and it was covered in snow at the time. As explained, two days before the murder, the family hosted a Christmas party in their home and gave guests a tour of the house. It's possible that the murderer used this to scout it out or even stayed there at night and didn't leave, hiding and waiting for the perfect opportunity. In the bed, that this intruder was already in your house. Absolutely. It is even used as evidence against John Ramsey that the date of death on John Bonet's headstone was listed as December 25th, despite not actually having evidence that that's the day she died. She could have died on the 26th. Many people believe he did that because he's the one who knows when she actually died because he's the killer. Put the note the night of the 25th. And secondly, I didn't want people ever to forget that John Bonet was murdered on Christmas. What do you say to people that say you put the 25th because you knew when she died? <laughs> There's so many theories out there. I, I tell you why I did it. That's exactly what I just said. Did your daughter have a bed wedding incident that night? Did you get up? Did you get angry and did you hurt her? No, I did not. I don't know what else to say. How else do you say no except no? That you ever saw your mother fly into a rage? No. Did you ever see her throw anything? No. Did you ever see her break anything in a fit of anger? Cr smash anything down? No. Dishes, lamps? No. Throw anything at your father? No. She wasn't into corporal punishment. She didn't no. spank you all. No, she we never got, you. yeah, we didn't get spanked. It's often been questioned whether John Bonet actually liked the pageants or was this the mother living through her and she was putting pressure on her to perform and was unhappy with her daughter's last performance. We have trace evidence that appears to link you to the death of John Bonet. What would you tell me? Go back to the damn drawing board. I didn't do it. John Ramsey didn't do it and we didn't have a clue of the Anybody who did do it? Ramsey, did you kill John Bonet? No, I did not. Mrs. Ramsey, did you kill your daughter? No, I did not kill my daughter. They're just lies. They just lie, lie. We knew within fairly short order that the police were not competent, that they were focused on us, that there wasn't going to be an investigation. You well, must I... have conjured something in your head for you to come out and call me a murderer of my child. To those of you who may want to ask, let me address you very directly, I did not kill my daughter, Jean Benet. Let me assure you that I did not kill Jean Benet. I did not have anything to do with it. I love that child with my whole of my heart and soul. No one really knows what happened to John Bonet Ramsey. The odd details of the case will likely forever cloud the truth, and the case tragically remains unsolved. So as you can see, it is unsolved. It is a pretty hard case to figure out. The goal is just that we find her killer, that she's able to rest in peace. <sighs> this is this is just a hard one.